that theme from a little different angle. And so I want to talk to you this evening about the aim of your love. I want to flip this theme and kind of explore it from a different angle, and here's the reason why. Passionate, zealous, committed, willing to sacrifice Christ followers like are in this room are especially vulnerable to a misaligned love. And what is even more disconcerting and even more dangerous about that is that it happens so subtly, almost subliminally, you could even say accidentally. I came across a quote recently from Larry Osborne's new book called Accidental Pharisees. He says this, no one starts out with the desire to become a Pharisee. In the same way, no one ever looks in the mirror and sees a Pharisee. I've never heard anyone describe himself as a Pharisee. The word always describes someone else. But the truth is, and this is the part of the quote that I want to emphasize, the truth is accidental Pharisees are made up of people just like you and me, people who love God love the Scriptures, and are trying their best to live by them. The thing to note about accidental Pharisees is just that they're accidental. They're like dinner at Denny's. No one plans to go there. You just end up there. <laughs> you see, you can't be a lazy, lukewarm Christian leader going through the motions of ministry and end up as a Pharisee. To become an accidental Pharisee, you have to be zealous. You have to have passion. You have to be devoted to the Scriptures. You have to be disciplined and sacrificial. And in our context, we could say you have to be very much committed to and believe in your ministry. You have to want to see your ministry thrive you have to want to seize the opportunities before you, and that's why people like us are so vulnerable. Osborne puts it like this, the journey begins as a blind spot, not a sin spot. Now, let me give you one more quote from this intriguing book. If we fail to understand how spiritually impressive the Pharisees were, we will remain blind to the danger of becoming like them. We'll assume that their tragic transformation from passionate defenders of God into enemies of God could never happen to us. I developed my own concern for what Osborne describes as accidental Phariseeism when I was working on a book for Nav Press called Who is My Neighbor based on the parable of the Good Samaritan, I found myself really for the first time reflecting and meditating on why Jesus included the priest and the Levite in this story beyond the superficial reasons that had allowed me to completely distance myself from them and never really pay any attention to them because obviously whatever reason Jesus had, it didn't have anything to do with me. But I found myself being drawn to reflect on this. So I took a fresh look in the Scriptures, not just at the Pharisees, but at the entire group of religious elitists that consistently opposed the ministry of Jesus. And I began to ask myself, how could people so passionate, so zealous, so committed and willing to sacrifice be so wrong? And I came to a conclusion 
that the blind spot that opened the door of self-deception for the religious leaders of Jesus' day was the fact, and here's a key thought I want to give you, was the fact they confused loving their ministry with loving God. And it's not the same thing. Loving God results in intimacy. Loving your ministry results in activity. Activity is not by itself automatically incompatible with intimacy. But there is a difference between the fruitfulness that comes from abiding and the busyness that comes from striving. Dallas Willard puts it like this. Outward success brings a sense of accomplishment and a sense of responsibility for what has been achieved and for further achievement. The sense of accomplishment and responsibility reorients vision away from God to what we are doing and are to do, usually to the applause and support of sympathetic people. Ministry is what we spend our thoughts, feelings, and strength upon. Goals occupy the place of the vision of God in the inward life, and we find ourselves caught up in a visionless pursuit of various goals, grinding it out. And here's the key thought, last part of this quote from Dallas Willard. This is the point at which service to Christ replaces love for Christ. The danger that I face and perhaps each of us face is to slowly, almost imperceptibly, and even accidentally to allow the love we have for our ministry to compete with the love that we have for God. It's hardly ever a conscious decision. And so a key question for us this evening would be, how would I know if this is happening to me. I spent a lot of time thinking about that and wrestling with this question because I feel God has been exposing this danger in my own heart. And maybe you've never struggled with this problem. And if not, I just ask you, pray for the rest of us. But in trying to answer the question, how would I know if this was happening, I went back to the religious leaders of Jesus' day And I started looking for symptoms, macro-level symptoms, that perhaps could be warning signs to me that maybe I, too, am succumbing to this temptation. I came up with two signs worth mentioning. The first is I believe that the religious leaders of Jesus' day were concerned about status, and secondly, they were concerned about survival. Now, when we hear those thoughts, there's a bit of a relief saying, whew, because that doesn't, you know, relate to me, because I don't really care anything about status. But let's just think about the religious leaders of Jesus' day for a moment. It's plain to all of us that they were obsessed with status, with looking important, with being recognized as being important. And we could spend all evening tonight looking at specific examples in the New Testament, but what is more important for me is what are the signs of status in me? Tom Marshall, in his book, Understanding Leadership, talking about Christian leaders, said this, status has become the primary non-monetary reward for leadership. The subliminal line of thinking goes like this. I might not be rich, but at least I'm important. And I have lots of people who tell me I am. Problem is we're no more likely to be self-aware of our desire for status than we are to the danger of having fallen in love with our ministry. So the question is worth asking, how would I know if I'm concerned about status. And so let me just really briefly give you a few possible symptoms. Leaders that are concerned about status tend to leverage their position. They try to gain influence based on where they are on the org chart as opposed to who they are on the inside. I wouldn't 
suggest to you that it's never appropriate to play the boss card. If that's your default power base as a leader, you are a status-obsessed leader. Secondly, leaders concerned about status, leverage, association, using the names of other well-known leaders to try to boost their credibility. Sometime next week, it's almost a guarantee that I will be in a conversation with someone and I will be tempted to say to them, yeah, well, last week I was talking to Bob Coleman uh, back in Denver, uh, you know, author of uh, Master Plan of Evangelism. Don't look at me like you're trying to judge me. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you have already tweeted that you had dinner with Mark Burnett, right? Because we love to inflate ourselves by bragging about the important people that we have the opportunity to associate with. Leaders concerned about status tend to leverage information. They withhold unclassified information from their followers as a way to reinforce their influence. We learned how to do this on the playground when somebody ran up to us as little kids, whispered something in our ears that was absolutely meaningless, and we turned around to the first person who came by and said, I know something you don't know. And we've been playing that game with our followers ever since. The reality is very few decisions that your leadership team will ever make are genuinely confidential. It's the deliberations that need to be kept confidential, not the decisions. Wickify your minutes unless you have an absolutely good reason not to. Leaders concerned about status tend to leverage exaggeration overstating the results of our ministry in order to gain favor or acceptance with others, especially donors. Leaders concerned about status tend to leverage their education. They overemphasize the letters that come after their name and which institution gave them to us, and they make other people feel small so as to inflate themselves. Don't look at me like you don't have any idea what I'm talking about because we all know how to play this game. Two quick thoughts about status-based leadership. First of all, status is distasteful and easy to spot in others. It is very difficult.